Every year we see new developments on connectivity in aviation, faster services, streaming TV, better flight deck information, enhanced communications. Uh, it's an industry forecast to see revenues of about $1.7 billion by 2023. All of the panelists' companies make strong statements about the operational cost savings that their systems are able to help provide. In one case, uh, the provider claims that it saved airlines $1.9 in operating costs. We all routinely connect when we're in the air, with the latest and fastest data services being part of the marketing strategy of a number of airlines and business jet operators, and yet still I can't get an internet connection over Saudi or India. I really encourage you to ask any questions. I'm hoping we'll get more than uh, Thomas managed before. So this is... Uh, uh, my, my challenge to you. We have a captive audience of experts on uh, satellite phone and data technology. We'd love you to ask anything that you've always wanted to know about that. So on the panel, as I say, four leading uh, providers of connectivity. I thought I'd briefly give them the chance to pitch to you all with uh, a quick two minutes on where they are today and what they see coming. So, want to go first? Yeah, uh, John Peterson with Honeywell. I'm in charge of software and services with Honeywell. And I appreciate what VistaJet was saying with respect to how important it is to get economy of scale on, on some particular aspect of big data, data analytics, the algorithms, and then make sure that everybody has access to it in order to make sure that we don't have this very expensive redundancy of effort where everybody's trying to work on the same algorithm. And what Honeywell has done through acquisition in 2015 and then significant investment since then is we've actually created one of the uh, most comprehensive um, data software platforms available in aviation because within our business, when you go out and you talk to airlines, we're not about what's coming out of SAP. An aircraft network's about airing 429. It's about airing 717. It's about 422 data buses. It's about Amadeus. It's about ASCB. It's about all of these different things, all these different labels, all these different conversions of labels that no one else anywhere in any other industry really uses or understands. And we're one of the experts in the industry on that. So what we have done is created a big data lake where airlines can put their data in. We have all the analytics and the algorithms and then we can provide to them what it is that they need, whether it be predictive or prescriptive analytics, whether it be fuel savings, whether it be optimization during flight, whether it be optimization around weather and traffic and those sorts of things. Now that that's been built and economized within something like the airline industry where you've got 27,000 aircraft, now what we can do is we're finding ways that we can bring this over to the business aviation industry. And so now our goal is to see where MROs and OEMs create an environment where they can use these data that comes off of aircraft now that pipes are out there with L-band, KU-band, KA-band, as well as AT&T type GSM on the ground. And now what OEMs can do is become more like a Tesla because now they've got an expert who can read the buses and giving meaningful information. Now they can call the operator and have proactive maintenance and proactive support rather than being judged by how fast they moved reactively after there's a problem, after there's an AOG, they'll be judged at how well they move proactively in order to make sure that that AOG never happened. And you need big data to do that. You need data scientists to do it. You need the right software and you need the right interface to make that really a reality. Cool. Are you working with each other on all of this or is it very much a kind of segmented bit for Honeywell? Or are you, are you gonna put all the data together so everyone's got, you know, you're gonna work with each other effectively to help us all? So with respect to the data, the data belongs to the operator of the airline. With respect to the algorithms and the ability to provide some valuable information, that's available to everyone. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Harry Shapo. I'm an account manager for business aviation over in Marsat. If you haven't heard of Inmarsat, we've had over 30 years of experience. The best way to sum up our connectivity is global and mobile. If you think that in your head, then you... You can't go wrong. We actually fly our satellites off Old Street Roundabout. So if any of you have any spare time before you fly back, then uh, I, I invite you all to come have a look at our satellite operations center. Um, what do I see coming in the future? Um, so for Inmarsat, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice story. It's, it's, it's nice to be up here at the moment because we've got four years of experience of having a global KA market, and now we're looking to layer on top. So we're looking to look at exactly where customers need our connectivity and be able to direct our capacity to exactly where, where that's needed, as opposed to previously the, the, uh, the, the goal was to go global, which we did with our L-band networks beforehand, but now we're looking to really layer on top and, uh, and add to what we've got already. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Jim Zanino at GoGo. I manage the uh, global sales team. So as Lisa talked about yesterday, Google's big focus is on the Internet of Things and basically taking aviation. While we got the aircraft that are now connected, is actually connect all of aviation. So working on that data is what uh, John was saying too, and using it to improve your operations. So there's a lot of things that we do, you know, like with the airlines as well, because Google has been on the airlines for close to 10 years now, various airlines throughout the U.S. We've done a lot of programs with them that we're now moving down into um, the business aviation market. The other thing we really focused on over the last year with our new uh, Avance product line is that the boxes are always monitoring themselves and setting data down to our uh, service center so we know what's going on with the box. So we can know ahead of time if the box is starting to fail or if for some reason during the flight you have an outage for like say 10 minutes or so, we see that and then we can get back to the customer right away and what was going wrong or if there's a problem or like I said preempt a problem have a box waiting for them when they land. So a lot of that technology and using the new software, the data, and uh, just monitoring what's going on in the air is really helping to improve the operations. Hello everybody, uh, James Hardy with Collins Aerospace. Um, I've been involved with the Arring Direct uh, Business Aviation Services uh, program for uh, since 2006. Um, People sometimes ask us what, what business are we in? Well, we, we uh, do a lot of different things to provide uh, um, for three basic entities, which I, I consider to be the, the passengers, the uh, operations, including the flight crew, and the, the aircraft itself. But to really sum up what I, th what I think we're trying to do and how we see, see the future going out, we, we really are in the business of providing information and knowledge to uh, aircraft operators in business aviation that will allow, allow them to gain meaningful insights and make better decisions as they operate their aircraft. Just coming back to the saving operating cost, that's quite a, a strong statement that everyone's making. Um, give us some examples of, of how what you do helps an operator save cost and an owner save cost. I'll give you a nice question. So. There are a couple different ways to save on cost. So from an operator's perspective, one way to save on cost is when you get into KU type services or KA type services, you can provide a passenger experience for $50,000 a month or you can provide a passenger experience for $10,000 a month. And so oftentimes people say, well, the difference between those two experiences is how fast the data is moving across the pipe. And so people will say, well, I don't want the boss to be unhappy, so I'll just pay the most, and that way they get the fastest speeds. And then what they end up doing is using 20% of the actual spectrum that's available to them, and they're overpaying by $40,000 a month. And there's no reason for that. And so what we do is we are very intelligent in how we work with our customers, and then what we provide is sophisticated filtering and traffic shaping tools per device, per airplane, per passenger. And that allows the operators to actually set up their plans so that they can provide the best experience at the price that makes the most sense to the operator. So we're saving operators hundreds of thousands of dollars per year to provide the exact same experience. That's one example. Okay, and in terms of uh, sort of not just the satellite savings themselves and the satellite subscriptions, anything anything on a, a great plan. I can, I can see benefits for airlines yeah. in terms of least cost ratings and things. In the, um, in the airline business, a great example, we have 94 airlines that participate in a program on APUs. And so Honeywell makes APUs, we understand the APUs, we understand what it means when a starter takes two or three times to start. We understand what it means when a temperature output is uh, trending in the wrong direction. On ECS, we understand what it means when um, air temperature falls outside of 5% outside of norms and the pack needs to be replaced or a pump needs to be redone. And we know these things very well because we've got lots of data that proves it. And what we do is we provide what is called um, uh, predictive analytics to tell them that based upon these conditions, we anticipate a failure within five to 10 days. And then with that alert comes prescriptive, pres prescriptive analytics and what that does is that tells them these are the procedures you have to follow and the part numbers that have to be addressed. And by doing that, what we have found is we've had 30% um, reduction in unauthorized removals, 
35% reduction in no-fault found, and we have had um, an increase in aircraft availability due to ECS systems performing more efficiently. Okay, good, good example, I think. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, well, we certainly do all the, those kind of engineering type things. Um, we also uh, work with operators to provide information that, 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 that again, it's that pre pre prescriptive or predictive. Um, one of our partners is a company called Flight Risk, so they, we've got all the information about what's going on in, in uh, whether, uh, how the operation works. Um, we can set up uh, advanced triggers and alerts that will tell them hey, this, this weather conditions at this airport now means you need to follow these procedures and then actually put that procedure right in front of the crew there and then, uh, either on their iPad or, 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 you know, or, or, or contacting them. Um, so there's, there's a great opportunity to, um, I think that there's been an element of sort of, hey, we're going to give you lots of information and pilots then get to interpret it. The captain's responsible for all aspects of the flight and that's an incredibly almost, uh, uh, it's a desperate situation I think some, some of the time when you consider the amount of information that can, can uh, allude to any flight, especially an international long range that you've only just heard about the day before. Um, Operators in business aviation are not operating as part of an airline. They've got a lot of, lot of other things to consider. What we're aiming to do is try and get more and more in front of those situations in order to, um, again, create those meaningful insights and provide a, a, a solution to what you're going to do. Um, one of the other things we're working on at the moment is a, a, a FOQA program. We're, we've uh, got a, a deal with uh, a GE their um, CFOQA centerline, uh, CFOQA product. Um, and uh, that is about uh, collate, uh, aggregating information and then ultimately being able to say, instead of like having a post-flight report about how things went, which, you know, that's, that's going to be part of it, but ultimately leading towards, hey, this is what you're about, what we think you're about to encounter. These are the things you need to consider. Uh, might be something like, I don't know, 50% of uh, approaches are unstable at this airport during these kind of weather conditions. Anticipate it, be aware of it, prepare for it. Okay, so part of the, the Phil Brockwell aim to get rid of pilots eventually then. Um, with a shot. Uh, we are getting a few questions in, um, most relating to price, as you'd expect. Um, we need a one-off subscription price for all onboard connectivity per flight to avoid extra costs and nasty surprises, um, given that we're now paying $15 or whatever it is on a long-haul flight for, for, for unlimited Wi-Fi, um, and we're paying you know, similar per minute or whatever for the latest high-speed broadband. Is, what's your thought on, on uh, subscriptions particularly? But um, uh, Harry, do you want to have a shot? Sure, sure. So, so the question is, where do we see subscriptions going? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, the satellite industry at the moment is undergoing a bit of a, uh, bit of a revolution. Um, we're managing to uh, contract, build, and launch satellites much, much faster than ever. And as you'd expect, today's satellites are six times more powerful than the satellite that came three years previously. Um, so with this increase in capacity, you would expect... Uh, by the laws of economy, um, for prices then to start dropping. So the satellite industry is starting to move in, in, a, in a direction which will give you so much more capacity than you previously were used to and would start to kind of emulate those kind of terrestrial um, dynamics. I'm not saying we'll ever get there, but obviously the, uh, the cost and management of operating a satellite is, uh, is fairly extreme, as we, uh, as we all know. Um, but what we will start to see is speeds going up and potentially prices starting to, uh, starting to uh, drop. Yeah, one of the things that we do at GoGo, I mean, we have by the hour plans where you can just have a flat fee where it's $90 per hour to run the system. So having things like that allow people to very easily know their cost up front. We also have unlimited plans in the US and air to ground network. We'll have similar plans once we get the KU system up and running. So a lot of those things will help you control your cost because you have a set fee and then you could take that down to the aircraft itself. So if that charter wants to just turn it on, you know what your cost is, it's fixed every month. So you have these bills that fluctuate back and forth and then you could actually use that to you know, charge the uh, charter. Eventually, I mean, a lot of stuff that you see in the airlines where you, you know, run your credit card right there on the airplane and you pay for your flight that time, those stuff is probably coming in the future. Um, 
can't say when or when it's going to happen, but it's, it's a pretty simple model when you think about it. It's just, you know, you get the, run the credit card, you just got to make sure it's secure and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the questions here was about, um, is there enough broad uh, bandwidth capacity for the operational improvements at the front end? Because um, I, I kind of guess at the moment we're sort of maxed out in the back of the aircraft now. Once you have streaming TV, at least in the next five-year horizon, I can't think of much that would suck more <coughs> bandwidth than that. But so, the front end of the aircraft, presumably, with your stuff, James. So you, you, you need to manage the experience across the aircraft. So one, one of the ways to deal with it in the front end of the aircraft might be uh, an EFB application with native applications on board. So the actual overhead of any data that's going to the front of the aircraft um, is, it would be relatively small at that point. It's just you know pixels and, and, and ones and zeros. Not, and it's not sort of live streaming type uh, information. Pilots are not usually watching movies. Uh, on Netflix um, over the internet in, on board. But then again, and there's the other part of it. It's like, yes, you could do live streaming in the back. You might, the passenger may well want to do that for a number of reasons. Maybe it's a, 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 um, a IPTV type solution or, or, you know, to watch a sports event or, or something that's uh, something like that. But the other opportunity is to, to, to manage the cabin experience. So you're not, you don't necessarily want to be buffering and live streaming and, and, and facing that kind of poor experience when you can get a, a decent cabin management system, have, you know, uh, Hollywood movies, basically Netflix type thing experience on board an aircraft with a, with a solution there. And there's some very, uh, uh, you know, we, we, offer, we offer these solutions. Uh, they, the, the way they go now is that you just kind of bring your own device or you can have uh, build in the devices onto, onto the aircraft, depending on what the platform is. Yeah. Um, do you get a sense that people are actually using the technology to the fullest extent in the back of the aircraft? I mean, it, satellite TV, perhaps this is a bit climate change denier, but to me it seems a bit gimmicky. Um, perhaps I'm the only one in the room because no, no comment came from that direction. But watching TV on an aircraft, the novelty I'd have thought would have worn out at least 15 minutes of Sky News would do me in for the rest of the day. But is that, I mean, you presumably can see the bandwidth that's going through. Is it, is it a regularly used bit of, bit of technology at the moment? You see it with, in particular with sports. On my flight last week to Germany, I used it to watch the AFC Championship game because I wanted to make sure the Patriots won. So that's where you see the most. Uh, we have other customers like you know, Major League Baseball and used it the whole time during the playoffs. They streamed live TV on the aircraft so they could watch all the games as they're flying back and forth. You probably see it more in that kind of scenarios where you know, someone has their favorite team, they want to watch some sort of sports. Movies, you know, like James said, is you could do that. It's capable, but there's much better solutions and a lot of cheaper solutions if you just have it on board the aircraft. Because when you start streaming video, you're talking gigabytes of data. It's not megabytes. And it's, yeah, the, the price is coming down, but that's still a lot of money. I mean, you're starting to you know, stream two or three movies at the same time. So, like I said, you don't see a whole lot of that going on, but people do it. Well, I, I have to disagree, I'm afraid. Um, so we have over 450 aircraft um, at the moment flying on our, uh, our Jet Connect system. <clears throat> and we're seeing, um, we've got more or less um, un unlimited plans at the moment. So what we are seeing is we're seeing people streaming constantly. We're seeing some really, really high usage in the, in the, in the cabin. And that can be from a range of things. That can be complex financial algorithms being run. as like an office in the sky. It can be live TV, which we often have. Hopefully nobody's watching Arsenal anytime soon because that's not a, that's not a nice experience. Um, but we're also seeing um, multiple users accessing the internet all at the same time. Whereas previously you had to prioritize a principal, now you can have playing through the principal, you can have his kids playing Fortnite, you can have all sorts. We're, we're at the, the maturity now where we can offer the bandwidth to allow a, a, a wider range of activities. Um, interesting poll going on here. Um, massively surprised by you all being worried about price of uh, internet in the sky. Um, I'm sure I can give them a pitch if you want to explain why it's so expensive, but perhaps we won't just at the moment. Um, good question on why such long lead times for new installations and upgrades? Anyone? Well, there are a number of there are a number of different reasons why, but you can take a look at something that GoGo is doing, and they're breaking down a, an airliner and doing an installation in less than four days. And with an antenna that requires vastly more fasteners, is much more sophisticated to install, including the radome. And so a lot of reasons why it takes so many days has to do with the fact that the uh, MROs are usually doing a lot of other work at the same time they're doing it. They're not just putting it down exclusively for the purpose of 
just putting that in. And then the other part about it is there are programs out there, Honeywell has programs out there with MROs where we've taken 45 days down to 10 days, and the goal is to get it down to five days. But when you're doing these sorts of things, the operator's got to be committed to putting it down exclusively for that one activity and only that activity installed exactly per the STC. And oftentimes, once an operator commits to putting their aircraft down in business aviation, there, there's a laundry list that's got to get done at the same time. So a lot of downtime is uh, biased due to the fact there's just a lot of other work being done. But it can be done faster if that's what people really want to have. Okay, if, I'm not sure if that's answered the question that this person specifically asked, so if you want to, to ask it more fully, please do. Um, uh, the GDPR question in the room, we've always, uh, always liked to ask our data protection regulations rules. Um, uh, what do you do with the data you capture? Are you farming it or are you using it for solid data reasons? I don't know why I keep looking at you, I'm very sorry. I'm no. sure everyone else does the same. Well, this one's an important question. So we don't farm it and we don't keep it unless the customer's paying us to keep it. And that would be an airline that's paying us to keep their aircraft network information for the purpose of doing analytics to run more efficiently. And with respect to cyber and security, um, that's really a handshake. It's a dovetail between what a partner like Immersat is doing along with what a service provider like Honeywell is doing. Because if you take a look at SATCOM systems, the modems encrypt the data. So the data on the aircraft is encrypted all the way through the ground earth station, all the way to the meet me point. And then the service providers are co-located with points of presence inside their meet me point, which is behind the guards, the gates, and the guns. And that is where the data is decrypted, handed over to us. And then what people do is they do something very simple and they say, I want you to encrypt it and send it to my network. A lot of Fortune 100 companies do that today. And then we'll decrypt it in our network and terminate it at the internet or do what we want to do. Or um, they choose to just terminate it at the internet like you would in a Starbucks or some other um, Wi-Fi at an airport or something like that. And then the additional thing that we're doing now in cyber that uh, Honeywell has taken on in cooperation with Immersat is people want to, what we're doing is we actually have threat detection on the aircraft because really the aircraft networks are not secured the way your laptop's secured right now. So you get on your laptop, your company, or you personally, I know I personally have it with my kids, I got, I got antivirus software on that laptop because I don't know what's going on. I, I probably don't want to know what's going on when they're using that device. So, but I've got antivirus software on that laptop. I know that laptop's protected and I don't have problems with that, but the aircraft networks aren't. So your passengers get on the aircraft, what's on their device? The aircraft are pulling information across the aircraft network. What are they pulling across? What's getting on the device? It's not gonna crash an airplane. Your aircraft networks for the cabin are not connected to your avionics and things like that but it could corrupt your aircraft network, and then who's gonna fix it, and when's it gonna be fixed, and what just happened to your passenger experience because someone didn't know any better. And so what we do is we actually protect the aircraft network, we provide, we provide the alerts, we provide all of those different things that you really want that you're getting from your antivirus software on your laptop. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna read this question out like I understand what it means. <laughs> um, is all KA band the same, or are there different providers? I don't even understand what that means, so if you want to explain what KA band was, that would help. What was the question? Um, you didn't understand it either, wow. Um, is all KA band the same? I'll let one of the KA guys answer that. So. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, so, is KA the same? Um, when you're thinking about answering that question, you need to bear in mind multiple factors. Um, you have to think, is it the same as in, is this regional KA or is this global KA? Is this wide beam KA? Stay with me, people. Or is this spot beam KA? Uh, a lot of this stuff uh, sounds very complex when you first start thinking about it, but really um, the important thing to think about when you're choosing a KA provider is what your needs are. Um, there, there, are other, there are lots of providers in KA. Um, in Mars, that was um, um, just decided to go down the KA route about, uh, about eight years ago and it's worked out for us and it's been very flattering that a lot of the KU providers have started moving in that direction since. Um, but really when you start thinking about KA, KA is a frequency band, it's a, it's a, it's a high frequency band and it allows you to transfer more data than a traditional um, L-band link. 
Um, but that's really what you want to be thinking about when somebody asks you is, OK, the same. Start thinking about coverage, speed, reliability, um, what type of an architecture it has. Um, you, want to be, you want to be focusing mainly, if you're in a business aviation environment, on a mobile architecture, something that you're going to have a seamless experience as you travel across the world, as you transition from spot beam to spot beam. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a complex question. Um, and really, it's, to answer it, you need to start thinking exactly what your requirements are. I'm looking out into the room now to see who's nodding, because they obviously is the one person who asked that question, I guess. Um, moving on a little bit to helping operators track and move aircraft. A uh, number of very high profile aircraft losses, obviously recently um, MH370 is one example. Um, how close are we to providing real time tracking? And, and I guess as well, at what point does that become so affordable that it's at every level? Um, so it's uh, something that, that could help light aircraft as well, for instance. Well, a ADSB kind of solves nearly all of that. So, uh, and there's also space-based ADSB availability as well okay. as an option. So, as long as your aircraft is equipped with ADSB, which it has to be if it's operating in uh, North America and Europe, um, then it's going to be visible. And it, if you don't have it, then you're not you're not really flying that. Air, you're not going to be operating that aircraft in uh, in, in the airspace because you'll be pushed down so low that it'll become, uh, uh, oh, I did the maths on it once, and it's, it's like a 50% increase in fuel costs just to hop across the Atlantic at the lower levels. Okay, I, I, my, my catcher but question tracking. obviously wasn't that good. Yeah. Um, I was thinking more particularly, there's a lot of airlines sort of marketing, boasting about their ability to track their aircraft to within one feet at all times, and yet MH370 is one you know, glaring example. Obviously, we don't know where that is. Um, so, ADSB is is the solution to that. Then, the, I mean, it provides uh, a solution. There, are, there is also um, other. You know, we can the aircraft can broadcast its position itself um, through other networks, through the uh, ACARS network, yeah. um, over the satellite with Swift Broadband Safety Services, or uh, or over an Iridium network. So, there's a number of means to to to, to continually. Uh, push where, what, what your aircraft position is. And, and essentially, you know, we, we, you're creating this point-to-point -point communication solution that can be used by operators uh, and, and, and air traffic management as well. I mean, ultimately, that's what it's about. It's about all of these things are to do with being able to manage the airspace, understand where, where aircraft are so that you don't have to deploy thousands of assets, millions of dollars to try and recover an aircraft that, that disappeared. Yeah. Um, I'll ask the question from the GoGo -Go marketing department. Is GoGo -Go going to offer European coverage for business aviation? Yeah, so we are, we are working on a KU solution as well as we have Swift Broadband and Certus Solutions as well. So those are all be coming over to the uh, European market. Certus is kind of a you know, nice product for you know, KA, KU. All those systems require you to have a pretty big aircraft because they have your tail mount antennas or a fuselage mount antenna that's pretty large. So with the Certus product, you're getting up into, you're not gonna get the same kind of speeds. So the fastest it's gonna go is 1.4 megabytes per second. But with that, you could surf, you could uh, do stream audio, things like that. Pro you won't be able to do movies, but those antennas are gonna be patch antennas about this big or so. So those will be able to fit in a lot of your smaller aircraft. So it'll give you a solution of, of a higher speed so you do more capability with and still be able to fit it on your aircraft. Okay, thanks. Um, one for Inmarsat, when is Inmarsat? In Marsat, sorry, going to go really global, north south poles like Iridium. <laughs> Friendly bunch you've got out here today. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, so, actually, it, it, uh, nothing's impossible. Uh, we're constantly reevaluating our fleet and, uh, and, and our orbital slots and where we think of flying our satellites. Um, and we are, there is an, there's an internal program in which we're looking about the, the business case to see whether or not it is worthwhile um, connecting the poles. Obviously, f flights are going higher and higher. Um, it's getting closer and closer to the edge of coverage, so it's certainly something that we'll, uh, we're, we're considering. Um, interesting question about uh, the effect of KA band on health, but I'm not sure, seeing as you're all doctors, that would help to ask that one necessarily. Should OEM, uh, engine OEMs be paying for the data to monitor the condition of their engines? I'm loving these questions, I'm telling you. Uh, OEM, so engine OEMs, engine, engine manufacturers, should they be paying the operator and the owner to provide them with data on their... So the engine OEMs would work with the operator of the aircraft to capture that data. And if the operator of the aircraft is going to take a benefit from the OEMs having that data, I would imagine that they wouldn't want to sell it to them. 
If the, I would imagine if the um, person using that data is going to use it to charge the OEM more, they may have a different opinion about what they want that person to do with their data. Yeah. But at the end of the day, to capture that data and to use that data is a contractual relationship you have to have with the owner of the aircraft. Sure. Um, to be fair, with a Brexit discussion about to come up, we'll finish with all the comedy questions that have come up in this session because I think it will uh, leave us on a high point before a, a very interesting discussion on the future of the United Kingdom. Um, could you cost an example per hour for a teenager to use Fortnite well, on their aircraft? M my son plays Fortnite a lot, and uh, he's you know he he gets killed a lot if he's got a, a latency issue. So if you're going to send it your uh, instructions 24,000 miles out into space and, and expect to survive on Fortnite for very long, I don't think you're going to do it. So, Isn't it? Good well, luck. No, I'm just going to show my <laughs> ignorance, complete ignorance of Fortnite there. Um, oh, I'm not going to read that one out about Arsenal, that's silly. Um, if everyone, we've got 45 seconds. Oh, we're over time, actually. We haven't. So if everyone's streaming live TV, is anyone actually doing business on their business jet? No need for an answer to that one, I don't think. But um, any other questions before we break for Brexit in every respect? I can see Al's hand going up at the back, but I don't know if you want to ask a question. You've got a microphone as well. So. Right. Thank you very much.